What's up, what's up, what's up? This is your man, STL Strange Umar Lee. I am here with critically acclaimed author, Ben Westoff. Hello, Ben. Good to be here. Good to be. So Ben has written a lot of books, and uh, I just want to briefly talk about three of them. His latest book is... Should I hold it up? Little Brother. And it's about um, a, uh, a young man uh, that he mentored in the Big Brother program, Big Brother, mm -hmm. Big Sister. Young man from Kenlock, which people that know me know I've written about Kenlock and talked about it before. And uh, we'll get into that book later, but he also wrote a book on fentanyl. We know we have a fentanyl crisis uh, in this country. By the way, if you want to listen to the fentanyl audio book, it's free if you're an Amazon uh, subscriber on Audible. Uh, that doesn't cost you any money, does it? If I, say that. I don't know. I got to check into that. Yeah, yeah it's free. So it's, it's on Audible Plus. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, uh, he wrote a book. What was it? The Death Row book? Original Gangsters. Original Gangsters. What made you write about Original Gangsters? Were you talking about Suge Knight, Tupac, Death Row, that era? Well, that was the music I liked in high school growing up in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, and uh, I became L.A. Weekly music editor. So I got the chance to interview all my childhood heroes like Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, Ice-T. And uh, the book came out of that. At, at that time, I really loved the West Coast gangster rap. Uh, and St. Louis, as an example, booed Biggie off the stage, like in the last months of his life. This city was like really pro Tupac. Yeah, it seems like the South really, and you know, the Midwest yeah. identified with the West Coast because New York kind of thumbed their nose at exactly. everyone. So everyone else was kind of united. And also, you know, when they would hear like Brand Newbie and Tribe Called Quest, they'd be like, ain't nobody trying to hear that positive shit. You know, they want to hear about some shooting, you know. And um, St. Louis is culturally pretty Southern, so I think this, this they vibed um, with them. And, you know, I was in my idealistic Muslim stage at the time, and for Muslims, for Sunni Muslims, the East Coast is what's hot. And so I was on the East Coast, and you're not supposed to listen to music, you know, to be hardcore Salafi Muslims, uh, but, you know, a lot of us were listening in secret, and we would argue, you know, because they loved... The New York guys, right? Uh -huh. and, and and so we would uh, the five percenters. Yeah, uh, well, they, they didn't necessarily like the five percenters because uh, of their views on Islam. They viewed their their you know because they're Sunnis. So my people were Sunnis, mm -hmm. so but uh, that general ethos, you know, KRS One and, and stuff like that. Um, but at the time, I really loved Tupac, and I remember when Tupac died, my sister called me, uh, and I was very distraught when I found out he died. And I took a bus back to St. Louis, uh, not because of that. I was going anyway. And I get to Kenlock, get to the Boaz, and there's graffiti, Tupac, you know, uh, about Tupac. So he really touched something. But in retrospect, um, look at a lot of the Vlad videos. You know, I don't like Vlad. I think he's an instigator, a dick rider, you know, you know the whole nine yards. Um, I see another Tupac. I see a kid that was struggling to find his way, find his identity. It wasn't really about that life. And then he gets in Vegas and he runs up across somebody who really is about that life. You know, in Orlando Anderson. And uh, uh, I just think if he could have made it to that next level, there would have been something positive. You see what I'm trying to say? What, what well, yeah, I mean, he was only 25, right, when he died. Um, I mean, think about yourself at 25. Think about myself at 25. Yeah. I mean, we're not in any position to, like, be making these big decisions that affect a lot of people he was trying to, he was an artist he was like an activist he was leading these like gang truce meetings he was you know on the national stage he had all these con uh, court cases against him all the time he was like broke he needed money badly half the time he just um made a lot of bad decisions like we all do at that age yeah it always tell people the money and your background dictates how bet how how you can make mistakes if you're poor working class you don't have a lot of room for mistakes because they set you back for the rest of your life you know if you're kind of a privileged guy you know you could kind of fuck off your 20s yeah but you don't have that luxury you know if, if you know you don't have family uh well it's really true so suge knight who may never get out of prison now is it kind of surreal to you to see what he once was and you documented him and where he is today as a guy, not just in prison, but a guy that was getting his ass whooped and, you know, 
and everything. It's kind of an amazing fall from grace. Well, yeah, I think it's kind of like that story where somebody commits crimes all the time, you know, in their life, and then finally the police get them for something they probably didn't even really do. Like, mm -hmm. I, I documented that case, uh, spoke with the people, eyewitnesses, and they really do think he wasn't trying to kill that guy. But it's just like his karma was so bad, you got to think that that led to him all this finally happening but um yeah it is surreal to think about what he built in such a short time and um the reverberating effects still did you talk to any of the people around easy did you document yeah yeah what's what's the muslim brother who's out in vegas now uh that was in real compton city g's oh lot. yeah yeah bg knockout bg knockout yeah. i mean he seems real sharp now i've got a chance to talk to him a couple of times and he he, he just you know, I always talk about a lot of the negative, the conversion experience going awry, but he seems like someone that really got grounded after uh, conversion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he could have easily been a story like Tupac's. You know, he was really in the thick of things, but, uh, you know, he really uh, got his act together. Yeah. Um, fentanyl, what made you, I mean, we got a fentanyl crisis, um, and... Uh, St. Louis is the most violent city in America. And even with that, there are more people dying in fentanyl. What, what made you decide to write about uh, fentanyl? Well, I had a friend who died from fentanyl. And, um, and then I just uh, kept hearing that it was made in China, but no reporter had ever done any real investigation into that. So that's kind of my specialty is like deep investigation. So in this case, I went undercover into these... Uh, these uh, Chinese chemical companies that are making fentanyl. And, um, you know, I went to Wuhan. This is before coronavirus. Mm. So it's that same sort of like chemical industry that is making fentanyl was also kind of like right at the center of the COVID outbreak. I don't know if you believe the conspiracy, the lab leak stuff, but it's kind of all in the same. But, but anyway, um, I wanted to just know about like why it's causing such devastation here and yeah st louis was like um the problem is awful here you know and when the opioid crisis started people thought about it as like a white problem like middle-aged white people but now you know this is the third wave of the opioid crisis there was the pills then there was heroin now it's fentanyl and fentanyl is hurting like inner city populations african-american populations just awful chicago st louis all across the Midwest, it's getting to the West now, and uh, nobody like knows to, what to do about it. People don't realize that every drug has fentanyl now. You know. Yeah, and, and this, like everyone I know who has died of fentanyl, with the exception of Basil Musler, who's Palestinian, are black. So I don't know where this. There's still this myth out here. This is a white crisis, and it's not, not like the crack. No, it's it's a crisis affecting uh, everyone. Yeah. yeah, and the the problem is like in St. Louis, you can. Um, what's interesting is that in the East Coast, it's all white powder heroin. On the West Coast, it's all black tar heroin, and so we're right in the middle. So you get both, but the way fentanyl was usually sold was in heroin, mm. and so people thought they were buying heroin, but there's fentanyl in it. Don't they put it in cocaine too? They put it in cocaine. They put it in meth, and the worst now is they put it in pills. Mm. So any black market pill, it might look like a Percocet, like a M30, they call them, an Adderall, uh, OxyContin. All of these can and do have fentanyl and kill you, can kill you right away. Have you, you've never used it, you said? I've never tried taking fentanyl. Try no, it. the problem is just that you don't know. Like, if they give it to you in the hospital yeah. for a colonoscopy, yeah. like, they have trained people to administer it. If you buy it on the street, these people, these guys are, like, mixing it up with a spoon. Right. And there's no way that's safe. We had a recently several fatalities in, in on um, 4551 Forest Park in uh, Central West End, a senior building, government building. It was like eight people died uh, from fentanyl overdose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was one down downtown too, um, and people don't don't think about it. You can, but there's ways to like test it. You know, there's fentanyl test strips. Um, there's there's good treatment programs for people now, but there's not always aware. But the, the test strips, to me, that's just some yuppie shit. You know, like some you know liberal politician came up with. It reminds me when I was arrested for selling drugs as a teenager, I had to go to drug treatment. I didn't do drugs. 
but they just wanted to say, look what we're doing. We're getting drug treatment. And this is, you know, it was just a way, you know, some political crony got a contract. But the dope fiend lifestyle yeah. is not about bringing around drug strips. The dope fiend lifestyle in St. Louis is ripping and running, stealing copper pipe, you know, you know, stealing catalytic converters. It's like wearing a condom. You know you're supposed to wear a condom. You just don't do it. Yeah, and I think you really hit the heart of the problem is yeah. that when people, especially if they're addicted already, and you know people get like a stash, they're not going to check it. They're right. you know they want to use the stash and um, ASAP. And that's that's the problem. Yeah, that's why people they could be addicted to heroin for twenty years, and you do one dose of what you think is heroin now, and it'll kill you. Unbelievable. Well, I, I mean, I don't know what to say about that, but I just, uh, it's a terrible thing and, you know, um, it's really frightening. So we move on to this book, Little Brother, and, you know, um, you're kind of an interesting guy. I kind of observe you from, from, from afar. I remember you did something that kind of made me chuckle at one time. Uh, you donated to the Islamic Foundation of Greater St. Louis, now, which is, the, uh, is on Facebook. You donated to it. And, uh, this, by the way, this is like the most wealthy Muslim organization in St. Louis. If you want to donate to Muslim, I can tell you some broke organizations you could uh, you could donate to. But I say, man, this guy is like a, a, a bleeding heart. You're like a real bleeding heart, man. And you got involved with the big because I wouldn't have gotten involved with the big brother. I'm just gonna keep it real because uh, I've already dealt with too many young knuckleheads, and uh, uh, mm. and I don't have the temperament. You know, I'll smack the shit out of them. I'll end up locked up. You know, or something like that. Uh, <laughs> But you, why did you get involved with Big Brother? I just wanted to actually make a difference because there's so many charities where um, they don't really need you. You know what I mean? Like I tried to build houses with Habitat for Humanity and they're like, come back next month. We have too many volunteers. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I like meeting people and like really making a one on one connection. And so this guy's name is Jarrell Cleveland. He was eight years old. He lived in Forest Park Southeast, first of all, but then they moved to Ferguson, actually. And so I, you know, I didn't know about Ferguson. I didn't know about North County. I had like white middle-class friends who grew up in Ferguson. But then like over the course of his time there, it just got more and more dangerous. Um, he knew Michael Brown a little bit. He went to McClure. Um, you know, he always told me everything was all right in his life. But beneath the surface, he was having all these problems. He got shot at getting off the bus one day. And then uh, finally one day he was murdered in Kinlock, just a few blocks from his house. And so my first question, well, I had started to, to learn about, about Kinlock. And my first question was, why was he in Kinlock? Mm -hmm. And so my quest, um, the case went cold. The police, you know, didn't arrest anyone, not surprisingly. But uh, I wanted to find out who killed him and why, and his family wanted to know. The police weren't communicating with them at all, and so that's basically what I did with this book, is I found out who killed him. You know, um, I appreciate this because there's a mentality, and this is kind of my beef with writers on the right and the left. So the right, they do the same with the Muslim community and Russia and everything else. They, they. Um, like to sensationalize and whip up fear. Uh, and then writers who are more progressive tend to sugarcoat and ignore what doesn't fit the narrative. Uh, and so one of the things I ignore is violence and violent crime. You know, and me, you know, my brother-in-law murdered in, well, I think, 15. My nephew murdered on Thanksgiving 2017. My mother murdered in December of, of 2018. And, uh, and I'm not alone. There are many more families like mine in St. Louis. And uh, because it's so commonplace, people don't write about it because yeah. it's just another murder. And there are countries, I was in Israel when one person was murdered. This was not terror related. And the whole country, you know, uh, came together. Yeah. And, and murder is so common in St. Louis, it barely makes the news. Yeah, I think, you know, you're right about what you're saying about right and left. And um, just writing about some of these topics, like people accuse me of being a white savior. And yeah. Like, you know, you're, you know, going out. You know, it's like, well, what should I have not done? Should I have not been in the Big Brothers, Big Sisters They program? say the same thing about David Simon. They say, you know, anyone's trying to do good work, they say that about them. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, 
it's almost like saying you should just ignore that part of St. Louis. Like, that's not for you, you know. And um, my thing is, like, people don't know what happens. Like, the white, you know, so many white people who live in St. Louis think everything is, like, hunky-dory. They see these murders on the news, but they can't even associate that that's, like, someone who lives 10 miles away. Sometimes it's two or three blocks away. Yeah. And there's no, it's like two St. Louisans. They have no association. So, like, uh, Forest Park Southeast is the grove to the hipsters, yeah. right? They don't know anything about Forest Park Southeast. And so it's, it's it, when summer's coming up in St. Louis, you hear black St. Louisans, first thing you're going to hear, nine times out of ten is, man, it's going to be rough. And they're talking about all the violence because the summers are more dangerous. Yeah. And uh, white people are talking about, oh, we want to go to the lake and Ted Drew. It's a, it's, it's a complete different vantage point. Yeah, and it's so segregated, yeah. and the economy is so bad, you know, like, if you go to places like uh, New York, L.A., the coast, it's like there's more integrated communities, there's real, like, job growth, people have, like, good jobs, yeah. you know, but here, not only is it segregated, and, you know, there are jobs, Yeah, it's just that they're so, like, It's not economically jobs, vibrant, yeah. You know? I mean, the places for black migration according to the status are Atlanta Houston, Dallas, Charlotte Phoenix and the DC metro these are these are big areas and so there's this reverse migration you know people moving back down south uh -huh. and a lot of St. Louis African Americans moving to Dallas, Houston Atlanta um, because even though those coastal cities are vibrant they're a little hard to break into they're a little you know, high cost of living, high cost of living yeah. and a lot of nepotism and stuff like that. Uh, did you find it? Did you did you solve the murder? Or? I did. I found out who killed him. Don't but say it. The, pro the, the problem is that um, there's no prosecution. The the witness refuses to testify. You know, and I can understand that. He probably fears for his own life. But uh, you know, and his family, Jarrell's family, didn't necessarily even want a conviction. You know, they wanted to know who did it and why. And so that ultimately I was able to find out. You know, um, that's not uncommon. My brother-in-law, no one was arrested, even though two police officers witnessed the homicide. So that, that just tells you the level of law enforcement we have in the city of St. Louis. Uh, my, um, my nephew, no arrest. My mother, there was finally arrest last summer. Oh, really? So there's going to be a trial uh, uh, coming up. Oh, really? uh, three or I think four people were indicted for that. So, wow. um, how was he killed? Uh, he was just killed like point blank. And um, where in Kenlock was he killed? He was killed right at like the corner, right on the Berkeley line, basically right by um, by the junkyard. Court, Courtney and uh, uh, I'm forgetting. There's no like street signs. Yeah, Courtney. Section. Yeah, Courtney is a pretty nice block. You know, it's a preserved block with houses and stuff uh, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and uh, yeah, when I got there, there was like this argument over jurisdiction. His brother showed up, who was like a Marines trained paramedic. So he wanted to give him CPR because he was still breathing, but they wouldn't let him. And then the Kinlock police like disbanded like two years later or whatever. So St. Louis County took it over. And then I was just trying to talk to them I kept telling them like I'm an investigative reporter I could probably help with this case and they kept saying like you know we got this don't worry about it and um, finally I had to use like sneaky tactics to obtain all like the some, police uh, records like some Thomas Magnum Barnaby Jones Rockford Files old school 80s private investigator yeah it, it, it was a lot like that absolutely you weren't worried about getting shot yourself you are investigating a homicide yeah well I mean it's it, it was it was kind of scary. I mean, I admire your videos, and you know, I, I watched a lot of your videos to mm -hmm. learn about the lay of the land. And um, you know, I'm just fascinated by North County, really. You know, I didn't grow up there like you did, but yeah. just the demographic changes over the years. Yeah. It's just a unique place. It's a unique place, and what I've been telling people for years, they finally started listening after Ferguson. Now they now they forgot about it again. Uh -huh. Is that all the conversation in the St. Louis Metro was how do we revive, revive the city and bike lanes and dog parks and all that shit, uh -huh. you know. And uh, um, uh, and, that's, and I remember telling Paul Filler, a friend of mine that produces the uh, Pruago Myth, this is before Mike Brown. I said, man, 
If there's a riot in St. Louis, it's going to be in North County because the wheels were coming off and I was just there a couple of hours ago. It's, I mean, just, it's just, the, 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 everything is closed. Everything is boarded up. Uh, nothing new is opening other than, you know, uh, storefront churches and barbershops. And you can't sustain a, a, a community like that. Yeah, I mean, St. Louis is important, obviously, but it's only 300,000 people. You know, in the county, there's more than a million people. Right. And so, like, that's gr I, like so much is always being written about St. Louis, and that's great. But, like, people don't talk about the county. That's where the people live. But this that's, is, like, what yeah, we need to focus on. This is a national problem, though. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, it, it, if you look at the New York media, they write about Brooklyn, talk about Brooklyn, right? They only talk about the hipster neighborhoods. But there are more people living in immigrant neighborhoods in southern Brooklyn and in, you know, the, the still existing black neighborhoods. Uh, there are more people living in these places. Yeah. There are more people living in Queens. But journalists write about where they live yeah. and about what they're comfortable with. And most of them live in these kind of yuppie or hipster neighborhoods or affluent neighborhoods. That's what they know. That's what they write about. And North County is not sexy. At least North City is the city, and it's urban, and we got this history. I mean, North County, it doesn't look architecturally yeah. special. Uh, it just looks like suburbs, and a lot of them hate the suburbs. And, yeah. yeah, and people don't associate, like, you know, the word urban is, like, synonymous with crime, you right. know. And, but but it's, uh, since it's the suburbs, people don't make that same association. But so many problems, you know, there's, like, Coldwater Creek, you know, people's, like, the groundwater is poisoned. There's, you know, there's there's still strong like thriving communities, you know, throughout scattered throughout North County. Now uh, there's all these companies buying up the real estate, and you know, uh, uh, it, and did you get into the uh, um, the um, uh, job loss? Because used to have GM in North St. Louis. You had Ford in Hazelwood in North County. You had the GM parts plant in North County. You had McDonnell Douglas in North County. And countless smaller factories in North City, North County closed. I think people tend not to talk about the massive job loss when they talk about North County. Yeah, I think you're right. And, you know, I think those jobs have been replaced by, like, service industry jobs. You know, there's still factory jobs. There's still... Um, and then jobs pay decent, you know, there's Amazon jobs, things like that. Right. It's like hard to get to them, you know, the public bus transit lines is shit. Are, are weak, you know, yeah. you got to go all over the metro area. It's, uh, you know, people, I have a, a good friend who just got out of prison and like these uh, barriers are very real. Like, how are you going to get to work every day? So I'm going to bring this little brother book when I fly to Poland and Israel uh, next month. Um, that's going to be one of my reads. Um, and uh, I encourage people to buy this book, even though I haven't read it yet. But you're talking about North County, you're talking about Ken Lock, which I think are important issues. Um, and they're no longer sexy. They were sexy after Ferguson. And people have just, they've drifted away. And uh, if there's one thing people could take from that book, what do you think they should take? Um, I just think you got to get to know people, you know what I mean? Like, uh, that's what's great about Big Brothers Big Sisters, is that it helps you know if you're like a privileged white person, someone who you wouldn't know otherwise. And uh, for me, I'm still like friends with his family, with all his like diaspora people. And uh, it's just for your own education and just your own like life. It's great to know other kinds of people. So sign up to Big Brothers Big Sisters, stay off fentanyl, and um, don't trust Suge Knight. There you go. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. All right.